Welcome to one of our first Black Moments in Black History here at Phillips Theological Seminary. We are so grateful and just blessed to have an opportunity to speak today with the Professor Christina Dickerson Cousin. And I'll just give you an opportunity just to introduce yourself. Well, first, thanks so much for having me today. Yes, I'm Professor Christina Dickerson Cousin, and I am a professor of history at Quinnipiac University in Hamden, Connecticut. And I'm just so pleased to be chatting with you today. Excellent. Now, let's go ahead and just let everyone know that you are going to be giving our Black Histories and Native Lands lecture later on this month, on February the 23rd. And so this is really just a primer uh, just to give um, our community an opportunity to know a little bit about the AME Church and um, its origins, its relationship with Oklahoma. And so um, right now, I'm just going to get out of your way and just let you uh, inform us. So I thought it would be helpful to just make sure people have just a basic understanding of what the AME Church is so that when I give that lecture in February, everyone is coming from the same place of knowledge. So, I mean, of course, I can go on and on for hours about the history of the Amy Church, but I'll just give kind of a basic outline. So, the origins of the Amy Church really go back to the 18th century, where you have a man named Richard Allen, who was born enslaved in 1760. So, he was first enslaved in Philadelphia. He was owned by Benjamin Chu, who later sells him to a man named Stokely Sturgis in Delaware. So Allen is enslaved in Delaware, and even though he described Stokely Sturgis as a, you know, a good master, Sturgis still ended up selling several of Allen's family members because he fell on hard economic times. And so understandably, this caused Richard Allen a great deal of, you know, pain and turmoil. And around this time, he becomes really introduced to Methodism, to the Methodist movement that had been, you know, going on. And so he is really, you know, on fire by that. He eventually brings Methodist ministers to Stokely Sturgis's farm, and Sturgis allows this. And as a result of hearing these ministers, Stokely Sturgis says, okay, I am now convinced that slavery is wrong and that I should not be holding these people as slaves. But he doesn't free Allen immediately, but he does allow Allen to earn enough money to purchase his freedom. And so Allen goes about doing that. He's also going to Methodist meetings. And so Allen really is... Uh, there at the beginning of the Methodist movement in what becomes the United States. So he's very much a part of that. And so for the next several years, throughout the years of the Revolutionary War, Allen is working to earn enough money to purchase his freedom. So he finally earns enough in 1783, which of course is an important date for Americans. That's when we officially establish the United States as an independent nation apart from Britain. And that's the same year that Allen is able to purchase his freedom. And so Allen says, OK, I'm now free to move about as I wish. And so he devotes himself to traveling around and spreading Methodism. In 1784, he is present at what we call the Christmas Conference. So in 1784, Methodists in the United States say that, okay, we need our own, you know, denomination for the United States. Now that we are separate from Britain, we need to have our own official organization. And so the Methodist Episcopal Church is established in 1784 at this Christmas conference, and Richard Allen is there. He, again, is there at the beginning, really, of this Methodist movement, and he's there at the beginning of the establishment of the Methodist Episcopal Church. So he continues his work, you know, traveling and preaching, and in 1786, gets a more permanent preaching engagement in Philadelphia at St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church. And so he is regularly preaching to African-Americans who are, you know, coming to that church and they begin to grow in size and in number. More and more African-Americans are coming to, you know, hear Allen. And this starts to concern and 
uh, make some white Methodists at St. George's feel uncomfortable. And the result is that in November of 1787, there is a really uh, kind of nasty encounter where Richard Allen, Absalom Jones, and several other black Methodists were worshiping at the church. And, you know, a white usher was trying to force them to move to a separate section like, oh, black people aren't supposed to sit here. You're supposed to sit over there. And Absalom Jones says, okay, just let prayer end and we will move. And they just were insistent. No, you got to move. You got to move. And so prayer finally ends. So Alan, Absalom Jones, and the others say, you know what? <laughs> you can have it. We are going to head on out. And so then from there, Alan is committed to establishing a meeting house, a meeting place for Black Methodists where they won't feel, you know, uncomfortable or they won't feel as if they are being forced to, you know, go somewhere separate. And so this incident really bothers Alan, of course, as an African-American man, but it also bothers him as an authentic Wesleyan. So again, he was there at the beginning of this Methodist movement. He knew what it was supposed to be. The whole reason he was attracted to Methodism at all was because Methodists were supposed to be the people who didn't care about, you know, your race or your, your status. They were supposed to be, we preach to everyone. We wear the simple black suit. We are not the, you know, highfalutin hierarchical people. We preach to everybody. So when Alan saw and witnessed that behavior at St. George's in 1787, He's saying, okay, well, something is going wrong in the Methodist movement because that is not what this is supposed to be. And so really, as he moves forward, he is trying to reclaim authentic Wesleyanism, authentic Methodism, because he knows what it's supposed to be and it's not supposed to be that. So he purchases a plot of land. Eventually, he, with the assistance of other African-Americans, they uh, establish what becomes Bethel Church. And this is their, you know, going to be their, their meeting house. But the white Methodists try to exert control over that church. And Alan is saying, no, we bought the land. This is, this is our church. And so they fight about it for many years until finally in 1816, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court sides in favor of Allen and the black Methodists saying, no, this is, this is theirs. And so they win. And so a few months after that, success in court, Allen brings together other Black Methodists from around the Mid-Atlantic region who have also felt mistreated in white Methodist organizations. And so he brings them all together. They all meet at Bethel Church and decide that we are going to form our own denomination. And so this is the birth of what they call the African Methodist Episcopal Church. So this will be a denomination that is, of course, composed of Bethel, which becomes Mother Bethel AME Church. So that's what we call it now. But then we also have, you know, churches in Baltimore and, and various other places. And so after that formal establishment, you know, Allen is elected and consecrated as the first bishop. And he, you know, goes about trying to expand the denomination with very much the idea of being an Atlantic world institution. So the fact that the denomination is called African Methodist Episcopal, it's not meant to be exclusionary. It's not meant to say we are only for people of African descent. It really is for all marginalized people of color, for really anyone who wants to join. And so in this way, I, I argue in my book that Allen is trying to correct what he saw as going wrong in the Methodist movement, that we started out being a movement that was for everybody and was, you know, inclusive. But then when they treated us that way at St. George's, when they treated us this way in the years since then, they have lost their way. So the AME Church is a corrective to this. We are going to embrace everyone. Everyone is welcome. And so that's why early on you see people joining the AME Church from a variety of backgrounds. As my book talks about, you see a significant population of indigenous people, diverse indigenous people who join the AME church. They become ordained ministers in the AME church. And so again, this is really Allen's corrective to what he saw as going wrong in the Methodist movement. So the AME church continues to expand throughout the Atlantic world. And as the United States continues to expand westward, the AME church goes along with it. And one of the places that the AME Church eventually goes 
is Indian Territory, which becomes the state of Oklahoma. And so I'll talk a bit about what happens there. So by the time you get to the late 19th century, by the time you get to about 1870, there, there's a population of people living in Indian Territory, what we now know as Oklahoma, who are formerly enslaved people of the five civilized tribes. So the five civilized tribes, I'm sure you all are familiar with being in Oklahoma, are the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Seminole, and Creek nations. Originally, were, they were from the southeast, but they were forced to move westward and set up their lives in, in that area. And so all five of those tribes owned black slaves. And so those enslaved people, you know, really grow up in these indigenous nations. They speak indigenous languages. Some of them have indigenous ancestry. And so they really are a part of these nations, a part of these communities. And so by the time you get to 1870, now that slavery is over, they are very interested in forming their own institutions. So we are now in this new era of being free people and we want our own institutions. And so churches are a big part of that. So Annie Keel is a woman who was enslaved by Choctaw Chickasaw people, and she initiates contact with the Amy Church. So she reaches out to Alan Wright, who is at that time chief of the Choctaw Nation, and says, we really want to reach out to the Amy Church. And so he contacts the Arkansas Annual Conference because it's the closest and says, you know, we have some people here who would like you to come. And so AME ministers from Arkansas start to come into Indian Territory in 1870. And over the course of, you know, many years, they develop more and more churches to the point that in 1879, the AME Church establishes a separate conference just for Indian Territory, which they call the Indian Mission Annual Conference. So that's established in 1879. And the AME Church continues to expand and have churches in all of these five civilized tribes nations. And so they reach out to Black Indigenous people and they have, you know, a lot of interest. So that continues. You know, we go through the statehood period of Oklahoma. And in terms of where we are today, we still have a significant number of AME churches in Oklahoma. And that is, you know, the inheritance of those many years of work starting back in the 1870s. So that is sort of a very quick uh, summary of what the AV Church is and how we get to Oklahoma and the establishment of the denomination there. So I'm happy to answer any clarifying questions if you would like. No, thank you so much for that Um concise but detailed introduction of the African Methodist Episcopal Church and um, its origins here in Oklahoma. Um, I, I'm kind of curious about some of the things that you uh, mentioned with respect to uh, Richard Allen's early experiences of, of being sold and, um, and how uh, Wesleyanism, Methodism, um, was attracted in what ways could you um, say anything about more more specifically about the relationship between um, Wesleyanism and and how he discusses or relates his experience um, outside of the inclusion piece? Was it primarily the inclusion piece, or was there something else, um, some other aspects that that really attracted him to it, or is it? primarily kind of like it's um um yeah that's that's the question yeah so what he says so he he actually has a memoir autobiography autobiographical work called the life experience and gospel labors of the right reverend richard allen so i would encourage all the listeners to go and read that it's on google google books for free but he talks about why he was attracted to methodism and he says uh i'll paraphrase that because they speak a plain gospel, they have a good discipline, they are they, they are reaching out to people like me. They are um, not speaking in ways that don't make sense to us, but they are speaking in ways that speak to our experiences. We can relate to what they are saying. 
and the way they are preaching, the way they are expressing their theology, it, again, it makes sense to us and it speaks to our experiences and they accept us. They, they want us. And that is how he describes why he felt Methodism was impactful for him and why so many African-Americans were receptive to it. And because after that incident at St. George's, there were some among the black Methodists who said, you know what, forget Methodism. We'd rather just go somewhere else. And some of them do. Some of them uh, become Episcopalians. But Alan, you know, explains that, no, I am really going to stick with the Methodists because these were the first people to really reach out to people like me. They were the ones who came to me and, you know, spoke this plain gospel and I, you know, was converted. And so I, I'm, I'm not ready to give up on Methodism as a whole. And so what I argue in my book is that he reclaims authentic, you know, Methodism. Instead of saying, forget it, I want nothing to do with it. He says, no, I'm going to correct what went wrong and really hearken us back to what this movement was supposed to be. Now, um, here at Phillips, we have we offer have a Master of Arts in Social Justice um, and we're very um, committed to um, fighting oppression, discrimination, um, and injustice um, ac across various um, demographic and um, subject positions. And so I'm just curious, so um, might you say anything about, um, and also coming out of uh, this, coming out of transitioning to our new newness uh, post-pandemic, um, might you say anything either about um, how the AME Church, how Allen um, responded to to the pandemic um, in 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 er, in in his day, or um, what about his Wesleyanism, or how the church uh, responded to notions of ordination or recogni recognition of of women? Um, either, if you'd like to say either of those for individuals that just are are not familiar about the history and the legacy of the AME Church. Excellent. So the AME Church was an unapologetically abolitionist institution. It was clear from the beginning there are, you know, you know, it's that's just what it was. So for example, so Alan, you know, he becomes the first elected and consecrated bishop in 1816. By 1822, the church that we now know as Emmanuel, Amy Church in Charleston, that is where you had Denmark Vesey, you know, trying to, you know, organize that um, uh, insurrection that ultimately doesn't come to pass. And so the pastor of that church, Morris Brown, he knows he has to get out of Charleston because that happened. And so where does he go? He goes to Philadelphia where Richard Allen helps him. And eventually Morris Brown becomes the second bishop of the Amy Church. You have numerous Amy churches serving as stops on the Underground Railroad. The church I grew up in, Israel Amy Church in Albany, New York, was one such church. So, again, the Amy Church was very much about liberation from the beginning. And you can really look throughout Amy history to see further examples of that. Oliver Brown, um, Rosa Parks, many, many others who I can't even name. But that really has been the history of the denomination. And so in terms of women, Richard Allen did not ordain women. Women do not achieve full ordination until the mid-20th century in the Amy Church. But there were many female evangelists. So during Richard Allen's time, Jarena Lee, she was a, a woman from New Jersey, and she felt very much that she was called to preach. And she says that to Alan. And Alan initially says, no, I don't think women are called to do that. But later on, they have an experience that changes his mind. They're attending a service together. And the minister who was preaching lost his, lost his place or something happened where he couldn't finish. And Jerina Lee just jumps up and starts preaching in his stead. And this convinces Richard Allen that, okay, actually, maybe I was wrong. Maybe she really is called to preach. And so he does authorize her to, to preach. And so there are many female evangelists who preach in the church after that. Women also serve in significant roles 
uh, being in charge of auxiliaries. So the uh, Women's Parent Might Missionary Society, the Women's Home and Foreign Missionary Society, uh, women serve in you know numerous roles in terms of that. And so there is really a rich history of female uh, involvement in denominational affairs. And Annie Keel, who I mentioned a bit before, the one who initiates bringing the Amy Church to Indian Territory, she is one among many women who initiate bringing Amy Churches, establishing Amy Churches in the West. So you have Annie Keel, you have Biddy Mason in California, you have Priscilla Baltimore in Illinois. And so women really are an integral part of this denomination in terms of not only preaching, but, you know, being laity and establishing churches and uh, serving in the roles in these auxiliaries. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, is there anything else you would like to offer? Um, anything that you would recommend for our audience to um, look at um, prior to your lecture on the 23rd? Well, certainly you could pick up my book and read that. <laughs> but also the book, The African Methodist Episcopal Church, A History, uh, which was published by my father, Dennis C. Dickerson, who is a professor at Vanderbilt. He That came out in 2020, and it really is the definitive work uh, on AME history, the denomination's history as a whole. So I would certainly recommend picking that up. And it's a, you know, it's a hefty volume, but it will give you a really good understanding of the denomination's history. And yeah, if you could pick those up, that would be great. Excellent. And it's an excellent volume also. Um, it would be behind me right now if it wasn't on my bookshelf at home. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much for this time. We really enjoyed it. And we look forward to having you share with us even more in depth um, on our Black Histories and Native Lands lecture at the end of the month. Um, thank you. And I look forward to um, being with you uh, later. Take care. Absolutely. Can't wait.